I come to you through a rather circuit uh, just, uh, route. I don't come directly from England, but from Spain. There, uh, last week, I gave a lecture at the university in Pamplona on epistemology in a room about this size, but much to my surprise, there were bodyguards assigned to me and a dog trained to sniff out bombs. I thought, here in Spain, they do take epistemology seriously. <laughs> The reason they were there was because that is an area afflicted by uh, terrorism, Basque and terrorism. This is one university in which the faith is proclaimed, a pontifical uh, university under the patronage of Our Lady, the Seat of Wisdom. Our Lady is always a threat to those who lie. Terrorists terrorize everyone else, but they are terrorized by Our Lady. She is the great teacher of the Church. You've asked me to speak about her in connection with Protestantism. I can very easily begin by describing a room I was in about a month ago in Birmingham, England. This was the room that Cardinal Newman used in his last years. Various portraits of friends around the walls, his altar where I had the privilege to say Mass using his chalice at the invitation of the Oratorian Fathers. One thing particularly struck me. There was one picture of a church over the door. It was the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin uh, in Oxford. There, Newman, for many years, had been vicar. That church had been built centuries before uh, the Protestant split from the Catholic Church, yet it retained its identity, its dedication to the Blessed Mother. The statue of Our Lady is over the door today. It is what we would call a Protestant church. But it struck me the other week that in Oxford, the Catholics say everything in English now in the Mass. If you go to the Protestant church, the service is all in Latin, <laughs> and the sermon is preached in Latin. Because that is the academic language of a university, at the time of the so-called Reformation, there was no need to uh, change. In the University Church in 1843, a year before he was received uh, into the Catholic Church, Newman preached a sermon on Our Lady. Over the years, his consciousness of who she is and what she means, what she does, had become clearer to him. And in that sermon, he said, that Our Lady is a teacher. She is the model of wisdom uh, for the university, for all who would take doctrine seriously. Here's one line in there. She does not merely accept the doctrine. She dwells upon it. She does not merely possess it, she uses it, she does not merely assent to it, she develops it. She does not simply submit her reason to it, she reasons upon it. Therefore, she represents to us not only the faith of the simple believer, 
but the faith of the great doctors of the church who were obliged to study, to ponder, to investigate, to weigh and develop as well as proclaim the gospel. This is a very high theology of the Blessed Mother. And it was preached before he became officially a Catholic. He had inherited a tradition which had not entirely gone out. Newman was aware of the great patrimony of the church, and forgive me, I mean matrimony as well. <laughs> One has to be very careful these days. But the ancient fathers of the church knew that they were fathers, and the mothers knew they were mothers. <laughs> it was in the library of that university where the wisdom of the fathers, their writings about Our Lady, and their prayer about Our Lady became enkindled again in the hearts of many people who did not consider themselves Roman Catholics. They had their own interpretation of the church, they had their own understanding of the history of the church and how she had been torn asunder. Nevertheless, they understood that at the heart of all true understanding of the church is Our Lady. It did not seem to them to be a con that there was a contradiction between being a Protestant uh, and being uh, a child of Our Lady. But the more Newman pondered this mystery, the more he realized that the fathers had taken a stand against a lie. That lie expressed itself in the controversy over the definition of who La Our Lady is. Is she or is she not the Mother of God? This mystery eventually led Newman into the fullness of the Church. Yet he, before being a Catholic, was able to spread before his university, before the students, this deep and profound mystery. This is something we must bear in mind when we talk about Protestants and the Blessed Virgin Mary. There are different kinds of Protestants. What do we mean when we talk about Protestants? I am frequently asked over there by people, what was the weather like in the United States? I say, what part of the United States? <laughs> when we talk about Protestants and the Blessed Mother, we must ask, what part of Protestantism do we mean? Which Protestants are we speaking of? Do we mean Thomas Cromwell, who wanted to lay Catholicism barren and strew it with salt? Or do we mean the noble Huguenots of France who suffered much themselves and crossed the sea to help spread a great and dignified civilization? Do we mean Oliver Cromwell, for whom the only good Catholic was a dead one? Or do we mean King Charles I, who was sentenced to death by Oliver Cromwell, died considering himself a Protestant king, and nevertheless a martyr for episcopacy rather than mob rule? who went to the scaffold holding a crucifix, invoking the Blessed Mother. Do we mean a fanatic like Titus Oates, who perjured himself to secure the execution of Catholics? Or do we mean John Wesley, whose Methodist movement attained that nickname because he insisted upon a methodical daily celebration of Holy Communion, who recited the rosary as he was dying. 
Do we mean a fanatic like Gordon of the Gordon Riots? Or a noble evangelical like General Gordon, who was slaughtered by the Mahdi dervishes in Egypt, carrying uh, on his person a copy of Newman's Dream of Gerontius? Do we mean Florence Nightingale, or do we mean Tammy Baker? <laughs> do we mean Karl Barth or Jimmy Swagger? What do we mean when we say Protestant? There are two basic strains of which we can speak. One does not really consider itself a Protestant at all, at least in its higher development, I mean Anglicanism. I was brought up an Anglican, and much of our theological apologetic consisted in attacking the Protestants. We were far more suspicious of any kind of ecumenical approach to Protestantism than Roman Catholics are. Anglicanism basically was a political accident. It only developed a, a theology to justify itself as the years went on and politics became more complicated. The shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham in England, far more ancient than the large Marian shrines today in France and Portugal, was revived in this century by a high Anglican vicar, much to the shock of his own bishop, who was a low churchman and did not understand how a Protestant could make such a fuss over the mother of Christ. This vicar used to play, uh, pray in his church at the communion service for our reverend bishop and all other aged incompetents. <laughs> he approached Queen Mary once for a contribution to this shrine, the grandmother of the present Queen of England a great antiquarian and a great lady, but she really had no idea of what the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham was about. And when he got done explaining it, he said, she said, this is all very interesting, but could you explain to me one thing? Who exactly was this Lady Walsingham? <laughs> While there was this effort to re recover devotion to the mother of our Lord, the uh, official tone of the Anglican Church was, as it is generally liked to be, reserved. So it was that Ronald Knox, when still an Anglican, said to his bishop, what it all boils down to, my Lord, is this. I consider her to be the mother of God and the Queen of Heaven, and you think she's a dead Roman Catholic. <laughs> as Our Lady teaches us, as Our Lady not only accepts doctrine but dwells upon it, not only possesses it but uses it, not only uh, dwells and thinks upon it and accepts it but develops it, so does she lead anyone who thinks about her deeply enough into the fullness of her household. She is a mother, and she is a mother of a large family, and she knows where all her children are, but she wants them ever closer to her. That's the one strain of which we might speak when we consider Protestantism, but I have a feeling in the context of this conference you are interested in something else. The second strain is what we would call uh, continental Protestantism. But within that, we have three basic identities as well. The first, the confessional tradition, the classical continental reform tradition, that of Zwingli and Luther and Calvin. They had so imbued the Marian fact that as their theology disintegrated, Our Lady still loomed above them. Zwingli had no great difficulty 
with honor to Our Lady. He tried to define it in various ways peculiar to himself, but he did not deny her central place in salvation history. Luther speaks in the most extravagant way to modern Protestant ears. He maintained for a long time devotion mm, to the Immaculate Heart. He kept liturgically the Marian feasts, such as the Annunciation. In one sermon he says, If Our Lady were to enter Jerusalem today in a golden coach, drawn by 4,000 horses, it would not be an honor great enough for she who bore in her womb our Savior, Martin Luther. Calvin was a little more cautious, but he himself spoke as a son when he spoke of his mother in heaven. For if we disagree with their theology, as we must, they at least were theological. They understood that theological words mean something. They understood that the Council of Ephesus was an ecumenical council, that the definition of theotokos meant something important. So just as the Greeks spoke of the theotokos, the God-bearer, so Luther was able to speak of the Gottes Gebaren. He was able to speak of the Gottes Mütter. He was able to speak of this Mother of God, just as Ephesus did. That tradition gradually was watered down. It was only in our century that certain noble voices recovered it. Probably the greatest of all being Karl Barth who in his church dogmatic spends page after page after page on Mariology. He has his grave reservations, and he was a little cynical about what he considered unscriptural developments. In 1950, he surprised some of his fellow faculty in Germany when he expressed a desire to go to Rome to attend the definition of the Assumption. He said, after spending a whole lifetime in a German theological faculty, it will be so refreshing to hear one man say something infallibly. <laughs> but there's another tradition as well, and we might say that it is the inevitable consequence of the errors in that first continental tradition. That tradition which stems from the subjective idealism of Kant through Schleiermacher, through Hegel, into the Historgeschichte school of noble figures, but cynical figures, more materialistic and anti-supernatural figures like uh, Kehler and Harnack, for whom Christ basically becomes not a supernatural redeemer, but a human moral precursor of the new man and the new age. Christ basically becomes, after them, a figure of speech. Schweitzer himself, that great noble genius and a missionary, a kind of saintly Protestant doctor of the church, as well as a doctor of the body, realized the inadequacies in that uh, simple historicism, so he re-emphasized the role of Christ as the prophet of the coming kingdom of God. But that too was inadequate, for he did not understand the full supernatural consequences of that kingdom, which so easily became simply a moral institution. After that, Bultmann completely made our Lord into an abstraction. And as many Catholic theologians have said, an abstraction does not need a mother. Liberal Protestantism became confused about Our Lady. They forgot Our Lady. At Christmas time in a liberal Protestant church, 
And they did exist. They don't exist much anymore. Our Lady was brought up from the boiler room at Christmas time, surrounded by little children dressed as sheep. And they were supposed to understand the great cosmic meaning of the Mother of God from that. It all faded away, that whole optimistic confidence in human self-perfectibility disappeared with the harsh evidences of the 20th century. And as it has disappeared, that mainline liberal Protestantism, sustained perhaps by endowments and by some impressive looking buildings which conceal the cancerous corruption within, it has been replaced by what we call fundamentalism, one of the greatest theological misnomers of all time. For a fundamentalist has missed the fundament of the faith. The word for a fundamentalist is really a literalist. The figure who, in the words of our Lord, strains at a gnat and swallows a camel. Our Lady does not only accept doctrine, she dwells upon it. She does not possess it, but she uses it. She does not simply assent to it, but she develops it. But that possession, that using, that dwelling upon it, that development is totally lost to the fundamentalist. The fundamentalist says, give me the old-time religion. The fundamentalist claims to be recovering the ancient faith of the church. Well, how ancient is it? The 19th century. The two great theological heresies of the modern age are Marxism and fundamentalism. They would not like to be linked together, but they are very much part of the same Victorian progressive optimism and rigorism which has been contradicted throughout history by Catholic truth. When the fundamentalist says, give me the old-time religion, he does not mean Augustine, he doesn't mean Chrysostom, he doesn't mean Cyril of Alexandria, he means Moody and Sankey, and those various other great illuminary preachers who did preach a positive and important social gospel at the time of the Industrial Revolution and thereafter when Many mainstream Christians had forgotten the inequities in society. This is why, for instance, the fundamentalists, and this is an aside, and I will not dwell upon it very much, were so dedicated to temperance. It wasn't because that they were Puritans. It was because they worked with the victims of the new mills of the industrial age, what Blake called these dark satanic mills. The Methodists preached to the men who were spending 16 and 17 hours in the factories and then spending their small paycheck on drink to wash away this kind of inhumanity. They knew about that. The Anglican landed gentry did not know about it. They could not understand how a good glass of port could bother anybody. After all, it sustained one when one went fox hunting. <laughs> so much of what we call fundamentalist moral theology is socially conditioned and for good reasons. It is said that most of the Western United States became uh, Baptist and Methodist because those preachers went out on horseback. The Presbyterians waited until there were stagecoaches, <laughs> and the Episcopalians waited for the invention of the Pullman car. <laughs> so we approach a certain amount of fundamentalist moral tradition with respect for what it does stand for. But notwithstanding, it has become corrupted because it was based on a very shaky foundation.
But we must remember the great problem that the fundamentalists had was with the thing they could have been saved from if they had only had our Blessed Mother to turn to, rigorism. It was rigorism, that kind of intense Puritanism, which does not understand creation as a sacrament, which created this great divorce between God and their moral reality. It was not peculiar to the fundamentalists. We must remember it crept into the Catholic experience as well, wherever Our Lady was misunderstood. And the great model of that is the Jansenist experiment. Or in the 20th century, certain groups in the Action Francaise, for instance, Charles Morat, wanted to suppress the Magnificat. Why? Because it was socialist. She was going to divest the rich of their property and re give it uh, to the poor. It was in 1913, Morat wrote on that. It reminds me very much of a headmaster of an Episcopalian boys' school I knew who would not let the boys sing the Magnificat because, number one, it was feminine, and number two, it said bad things about the rich. His school had been endowed by Mr. DuPont. <laughs> now, our Holy Father has just issued a new encyclical. And there are some people who are uncomfortable with it because it says some very strong things about social justice. Nothing stronger than Our Lady says in the Magnificat. But to understand what he's saying, to get the balance right, and not to politicize it the way the journalists do, we have to understand what Our Lady was saying in the Magnificat. For there's no social justice unless it involves justification before God. Redemption from sin. And this is why our Holy Father in his encyclical makes such a central focus on Our Lady as Mother of the Redeemer. She is not a Madame Mao. She's something far more radical than that. She is the woman who stands at the foot of the cross when the injustice of Satan himself, who is the dark shadow behind every kind of social injustice, uh, tries to do his final crime. Within the uh, Catholic tradition, there have been mistakes, not official mistakes, for as Newman teaches us, as Chesterton teaches us, orthodoxy is the great balance. It is like the charioteer, who sometimes moves a little that way, moves a little that way, but always stays on course where all the heresies go sp sprawling out, one way or the other. Marxism, fundamentalism, but they are all a heresies. A loss of that central balance. What greater voice gives us an image of Our Lady in the most symmetrical, crystalline and balanced way than the angelic doctor himself? And sometimes he's been thought to be too reserved in what he says. We must remember, he himself did not fully develop the Immaculate Conception. Nevertheless, he represents a high point in the understanding of Our Lady in the scheme of redemption. Within 200 years after Aquinas, we got very pious people saying some very pietistic things about Our Lady, which sowed the seeds for what the Protestants then would call abuses. And these were not light figures, they were serious and very noble figures. But they were guilty of what we might call an occasional excess of expression. St. Bernard of Siena, who said that Our Lady in her mother's womb was enjoying the beatific vision, an idea which had to be condemned. He was able to lecture on logic to the doctors of the church poetic excess which had to be condemned. 
Jean Gerson at the University of Paris died in 1429. Reminded the voices in the church that Our Lady leads us into truth. And that means that there's no need to be excessive in what we say about her. For what greater thing can we say than that she is the mother of God? We don't have to pretend that she was a great poet, that she was a great logician, or that she spoke perfect English. <laughs> we don't have to be like the curé in Lord, who told Bernadette that that voice could not have been Our Lady, for Our Lady would not have spoken such poor French. In the developing scholastic tradition, the doctors, one after another, had to put limits on some of this excessive language and iconography and so on. Peter Canisius, that great voice, that great Tridentine spirit, was able to explain the mystery of Our Lady by quoting Luther and Calvin back to themselves something we could learn to do today. He had to explain that Our Lady is not the voice of mercy pleading before a cruel Christ. And he cited the ancient patrimony of the Church to explain that. Another great voice of balance was Robert Bellarmine who accepted the Immaculate Conception but said that given the temper of the times and the difficulty of scriptural evidence we would be best to be reserved about it. And yet, voices continued out of exuberance to say rather more imbalanced things. Mary of Agrida in the 17th century made some uh, remarks in praise of Our Lady which had to be placed on the index in 1702. I only mention these things not to dampen enthusiasm because I do not think we are going to be drowned in a sea of enthusiasm at this moment in the life of the church. But to show <laughs> that when fundamentalists attack Catholicism for Mariolatry the church has done what she's always done maintain that balance of truth. We cannot idolize reality. And Our Lady is real. She uses, she ponders, and she develops what God has done to her. If you ask a fundamentalist his complaint about Marian theology, you will come up across three basic complaints. Number one, that excessive kind of language. That is exactly what the famous Dr. Pusey in England, the leader of the Catholic revival in Anglicanism, uh, complained about. He cited some of the excessive statements of Alphonsus Liguori, uh, Grignon de Montfort, and Bernardine of Siena. Not all of their comments were excessive. Totus tuus, the motto of our Holy Father, is taken from, among other sources, from a passage in Grignon, du Montfort. Nevertheless, Newman says to him, this is not the Catholic faith. And inasmuch as these people say what you say, they say it is to me like a bad dream, and I will have nothing to do with explaining anything which can only be explained by being explained away. Newman to Pusey in 1868. Excessive language is not Catholic language. Sentimentalism is unworthy of Our Lady. The second complaint of the fundamentalists is a perhaps superficial one, but it's something to bear in mind, and that is uh, the embellishments of devotion. Well, it's one thing to go to Paris and to see the great art in Notre Dame and Sacré-Cœur, 
but it's another thing to go to some of our more jerry-built shrines and see what people out of devotion have put up but which to a different culture seems rather Babylonish or what a 17th century divine called gaudy meretriciousness uh, the great theological aesthetical aesthetical theologian the Dutchman Gerardus van der Loos, says we mustn't be snobbish because the greatest shrines have usually been the tawdriest in terms of aesthetical perfection but that's true when it's been the uh, devoted offering of simple people offering the best in their own terms but I'm speaking of something else I'm speaking of sheer gaudiness erected by people who are trying to save money and who are not honoring Our Lady who is the mother of fair love and deserves the most beautiful things we can get not the cheapest things out of a store-bought catalog this may seem mm, uh, irrelevant but from an observer it is an important consideration and the third consideration is simply an ethnic one it's tied in with these others the way people express themselves if one is brought up in a certain ethnic tradition one can show devotion more immediately a Catholic in Africa worships with a certain kind of different style than one in Holland if one worships at all in Holland <laughs> and who is to say one is inferior one is superior one may naturally light candles in front of the statue one may do it some other way but there is a difference and that dif difference has to be respected as sometimes we forget that the fundamentalist operates from his own ethnic tradition we can be very snobby about rednecks there's a variety of differences within Protestantism I was at a meeting once and a monk had a guitar playing folk music and there was a cardinal present who wanted us all to hold hands and sway back and forth and sing this folk music and I had a nun next to me uh, who held my hand and she was perspiring uh, I said afterwards your eminence you have just talked about the great ethnic rainbow of Catholicism well I was brought up a wasp and that's ethnic too <laughs> and it's against my ethnic tradition to stand up and perspire and sway back and forth singing <laughs> I don't think that's totally irrelevant <laughs> why is it that when Mr. Dukakis speaks he's said to be speaking from a powerful ethnic tradition when Jesse Jackson speaks he's said to be speaking from a powerful ethnic tradition when George Bush speaks he's called a wimp <laughs> in a less degenerate society the term for that was gentleman and there are some people who don't understand this well in the fundamentalist tradition in final analysis there are two problems and these are problems which I think are insuperable they are based on an error and they can only be resolved by eliminating the error the first is a problem of understanding creation the fundamentalist has entered the history of creative experience about 150 years ago he doesn't understand the anthropology of Genesis he doesn't understand Eve and so he doesn't understand the anthropology of the apocalypse and the new Eve crushing the serpent whenever a fundamentalist speaks what we call solid moral doctrine beware it is not because it's based on natural law the fundamentalist does not understand natural law it's because it's part of his cultural givenness and when that culture changes that moral commitment will change we may unite with the fundamentalist now on what we call pro-life issues but that's a very constricted commitment to life it does not include contraception it does not really include the integrity of the family 
and the indissolubility of marriage. It used to, but when society bent, they bent. And the more society bends on abortion, I predict, the more the fundamentalist will bend as well. The fundamentalist moral commitment is not sustained by natural law, but by an enforced puritanical rigorism. And the Catholic Church has always spoken against that puritanical rigorism. When the Franciscans wanted to make their order more rigorous than St. Francis had planned it, Occam supported these so-called spiritual Franciscans, the precursors of the Jansenists. It was Pope John XXII who expressed the voice of Catholic moderation. The fundamentalist does not understand that balance. And the second uh, misunderstanding, which will lead fundamentalism into its own ruin, is a misunderstanding of the church. The fundamentalist has no ecclesiology, but the fundamentalist has no sense of what God has done truly in history. The fundamentalist bases his understanding of revelation on the same kind of heresy which gave us Marxism, a positivism. Auguste Comte and the atheist vision of man is the same foundation that the fundamentalist bases his theory on and calls it Christian fundamentalism. It isn't. It's post-rationalism. For this reason, the fundamentalists will never be able to understand what is meant by the church. It is sad to see that in, within Catholicism some aberrant interpretations have lent themselves to this idea. Scalabeeks, for instance, does not understand the divine election of holy orders, the ontological difference of the priesthood, and I'm sad to say a more sophisticated voice, that of Raymond Brown in his book on the priesthood, priests and deacons, says pretty much the same thing. But these are aberrant voices. In the end, it is that constant balance of the church focused upon the model of Our Lady, which leads us into all truth. For that reason, we can truly say that to get Mary wrong is to get the church wrong, and to get the church wrong is to get creation wrong. Every heresy basically is a Marian heresy. The fundamentalist speaks very much about history. Yet Our Lady has spoken to us in history. To ignore that is not to be a fundamentalist. It's to be a literalist who says that Our Lady and the saints cannot speak unless they speak on a certain page in my translation. To get Our Lady wrong is to get the Church wrong. It is to think that the Church is whatever we turn on when we turn on the television dial. And for that reason, the understanding of God's great works in history will be very much reduced. I still keep in uh, my breviary an obituary of a lady I never met, died a few years ago in White Plains here. It was just a kind of little cast-off obituary in a paper, but it said this lady had been born in Portugal and at Fatima had witnessed the miracle of the sun. Yeah, that was not a thousand years ago. She's in White Plains. There may be miracles going on now. Some people say there are. That's true fundamentalism. That's true witness to a miracle. I mean, this lady did not have a television evangelist in pancake makeup telling her arthritis is going away. She saw the sun dance. That's my idea of fundamentalism. History and witness to that history. For it is the Catholic Church which has always borne that fundamental witness more clearly and more truthfully and more vividly than anyone 
or anything else. When our Holy Father was shot in St. Peter's Square, all the way to the hospital he kept repeating the name of the Blessed Mother. That's witness. True witness to the gospel does not consist in what a man says on television as people throw money at him, but what a man says when he's bleeding and people are throwing bullets at him. Let no one say that they are evangelists. There's only one evangelist who can speak that way. And he is the world's only fundamentalist, for he is Peter. There can be no fundamentalism which is not fundamentally built upon the rock. We must claim this title because our... <laughs> our Lady has taught us this title in various ways. When Pius XII proclaimed the Assumption, he deliberately chose to do it not on what would be the Feast of the Assumption, but on All Saints' Day, for he was not inventing a new cult. He was showing that Our Lady is the Queen of the Saints, part of the whole cosmic reality. And he deliberately avoided using that controverted term, mediatrix, which is valid in itself, but which can be abused. Our present Holy Father, in his encyclical on Our Lady, avoids, as did the Second Vatican Council, that title co-redemptrix, a valid title, but which also lends itself in wrong hands to wrong abuse. This is the great balance of orthodoxy, and if we need any greater witness to it, we can only say in the end what she has been to us. Before I was a Catholic, I lit my first candle before a Marian shrine in Paris. I was there with a young Protestant friend of mine from Ulster. We didn't know really what we were doing, but we knew how to light a match and light a candle. <laughs> About 15 years later, in a process which I could not have anticipated, I found myself back in that cathedral, having been ordained in the Catholic Church. It was Easter afternoon. The church was completely full. We were standing, and an usher pointed to us two seats. I was with a companion from Rome. And they were right by the cardinal's throne. We thought they had been reserved. Everyone else thought so, too, so no one took them. <laughs> but they were just there, so we sat down. And as I was seated, I turned around, and there was a candle flickering. It was the same candle stand that I had lit years before, and it was the same statue looking down upon me. We don't know everything the mother knows, but she keeps secrets to herself. That may be why we have the Shroud of Turin today. You know what mothers are like. Every so often when you get very old or older, she'll produce something from your infancy that you wish you'd kept. <laughs> Our Blessed Mother may have reserved the Shroud for this skeptical generation. Mothers remember things and mothers keep things. And so poor Claudel was converted at that very same shrine in Notre Dame and he writes in his diary what St. Paul preached to me and Augustine explained to me and when Gregory broke bread for me with antiphon and response Our Lady above me was there to make it all clear to me. That's what we mean when we say she's not only Theotokos, but she's a mother. If I had been brought up in a Catholic seminary, and I was denied that great grace, but if I had been brought up in a Catholic seminary, I'm not quite sure that I would have understood Our Lady the way I did with my rather more limited upbringing. I'm quite sure my Latin would be a lot worse. And I did not learn the rosary as a Catholic. My rosary was taught to me, I always keep it with me, my rosary was taught to me by my grandmother, an English lady, and I'm not quite sure that she'd ever been in a Catholic church. 
But all her brothers had been killed on the front in the First World War. One um, had been going across a battlefield and heard the cry of a French soldier, and the French soldier was holding up the rosary and gave it to him as he died. Well, my great uncle didn't know really what it was, but he kept it. And when he was found on the battlefield, he had it with him, and it was sent home to my grandmother, and she kept it, and she didn't know all the prayers to say on it. But it had been passed on to her by him, by that other soldier, who was receiving something that had been given to St. Dominic and that St. Dominic had received from Our Lady who had also given a rattle to Our Lord when he sat on her lap. Mothers remember things and they accomplish things much better than we can understand. So when we get worried about fundamentalism we ask Our Lady to use her divine intercession before the throne of Christ to complete what they perceive only partially and if left at uh, that level will be ruined by but that they might see that in revelation is God himself that in history is providence and that in the church is not simply a man-made institution but the body of Christ who dwelt in the womb of Our Lady Cardinal Newman. I began with him and I'll end with him. England was called the Dowry of Our Lady because throughout the Middle Ages she had more shrines devoted to Our Lady than any of the nations of Europe and it all seemed to disappear. In the 19th century Pius IX restored the hierarchy. They assembled in Oscott and Birmingham with great trepidation. They did not know if this was going to be a successful experiment but Newman told them to invoke Our Lady. They placed over the gate of that building the first statue to have been erected since the Reformation, Our Blessed Mother looking down at them. And he told them, now look, the Mother is our Mother, and she always brings to new birth. She's bringing us to a new birth now. And this is the way he began his sermon the second spring which is the most fundamentalist sermon ever preached and which we should preach to all those who call themselves fundamentalists without really knowing what they mean. We have familiar experience of the order and the material world which surrounds us, frail and transitory as is every part of it, restless and migratory as are all its elements, never ceasing, as are its changes, still it abides. It is held together by a law of permanence, it is bound in unity. As it is ever dying, so is it ever coming to life again. And every death is parent to a thousand lives. Thank you. Thank you very much.